much. Okay, so thank you, um, Jane, again, for the invitation um, to talk about some of what I've been thinking about. And so for everyone watching, that is very much what this is. This is some stuff that I've been recently working on um, that I'm now just going to kind of talk through a little bit uh, at your expense, or hopefully um, for your entertainment. Uh, on that note, I want to thank everyone who's a here uh, for being here, for spending your time uh, here today. I hope your summers are going very well, all things considered, and uh, thanks for being here. So I'll start with just a few words about myself so you all know who I am, where this is coming from. So I'm a visiting assistant professor in political science where I teach classes on the history of political philosophy, uh, democratic theory, and environmental political thought primarily. So I like to think and read and write about ways that ordinary people uh, can play a role in our improving our common well-being. So in other words, I study forms of political action that are available to those of us who aren't or aren't yet or aren't only political elites. So people who aren't politicians, who don't hold elected offices, who aren't in charge of any company or company policy, who don't have too much power in the way that we usually understand it. Uh, to be sure, any one of us might end up in some or one of those powerful positions. But I think it's fair to say that most of us uh, will not, or at least will spend most of our lives not in one of those positions of power. So I want to know what politics looks like and how we can exercise it uh, if and when we're not in those official positions of power. That brings me, brings us to my talk today, where I'll be discussing the use of civil disobedience as a legal and political way that citizens have started to participate in the fight to stop climate change and move toward climate justice. So for our purposes, uh, the story starts in 2008. In 2008, in front of a rather formal, probably fairly uptight gathering of the Clinton Global Initiative, former Vice President Al Gore made a plea that stood out, to me at least, given the office that he had formerly held. Young people everywhere, Gore said, should be participating in civil disobedience in order to stop the engines of climate change. So think for a moment about the gravity of this situation. A mainstream political figure who had held the second most powerful office in the nation, almost elected to the first, was here making a public call for young people to break the law. In fact, as he said, he was surprised that young people weren't already doing this kind of thing. In front of a gathering of the Clinton Global Initiative, he wondered why there aren't rings of young people blocking bulldozers and preventing them from constructing coal-fired power stations. So given that we wouldn't usually expect a former vice president um, to recommend lawbreaking, we might wonder what compelled Gore to encourage the widespread use of civil disobedience in this case. If you're interested enough uh, to attend this talk, you likely already know the answer to this question, right? In short, climate, and we haven't been able to do too much to reduce the carbon um, dioxide emissions which drive climate change. If you feel like you don't know a lot of the background of where climate change comes from, how it works and what its effects will be and how we might respond to it, um, you know, unfortunately, this talk is not the place for me to go into those kinds of details, but I can recommend a few books uh, listed on the side of this slide. So um, David Wallace Wells has written a book called The Uninhabitable Earth, where he uh, cuts through the kind of scientific and technical language usually used to describe climate change and uses kind of very, uh, I'll say, easily, easy to read, uh, easy to read quickly, um, language to describe what we can and should expect climate change to look like moving forward. 
And then likely down below, there's a text that I haven't read yet, but have seen um, parts of uh, that is forthcoming in September that um, tries to not just sort of describe what climate change will look like, but really sort of talk about courageous kinds of solutions that we could pursue um, if we want. So again, if you feel like your background on climate change is not as robust as it could be, and you're interested after uh, this talk, I would recommend going to those sources. Suffice it to say, the climate is changing, and instead of pumping the brakes, it seems that we've collectively decided to floor the gas. But anyway, uh, back to Gore. After having done much to bring the problem of global warming to the public's attention through his um, film, An Inconvenient Truth, by 2008, Gore had already started to sense that the response of individuals, governments, um, businesses, and international institutions were not going to be enough, or were not working quickly enough. Civil disobedience, then, had started to appear necessary to Gore. By 2008, uh, this former vice president of the United States could openly call for young people everywhere to break the law. Over the next decade, uh, decade plus from 2008 to today, young people and many actually more, maybe not so young people, took up Gore's plea. So the first point uh, of my talk today is historical, or the first aspect of my talk today is historical. I want to cover a bit of the recent history of climate disobedience, of the use of civil disobedience to counter climate change. The second point is analytical. I want to spend some time um, trying to explain, trying to understand why climate disobedience do what they do, um, what hope they, uh, what they hope will come of their actions. And then I want to analyze this um, so-called necessity defense that they're increasingly making use of um, when they uh, face judges and juries in court. And then the third concluding point, which is going to be fairly brief, uh, is a critical point. I want to critique or um, push these activists a little bit. So I'll conclude by editorializing a little bit uh, pointing to what I see as some drawbacks uh, of climate disobedience and the use of this necessity defense uh, as it has been practiced. Specifically, I want to end by arguing that there's a risk that uh, the pursuit of a successful necessity defense um, in order to attain individual legal or procedural justice will attain those things at the expense of climate justice more generally. So if that distinction doesn't yet make sense to you, or if anything that I've said doesn't make sense, uh, not to worry quite yet. Uh, hopefully, some of this will by the end of the talk. If not, um, again, uh, there will be time for question and answer. So part one, uh, recent history of climate disobedience in the US. So again, it wasn't long after 2008 before people started to embrace nonviolent civil disobedience as a tool against climate change, thus stating, uh, starting the practice of what I'm calling climate disobedience. Gore made his plea in 2008. By December 2008, uh, a few months after Gore made the, the speech, the first high profile example had emerged. So that December, a 27-year-old University of Utah student walked into a federal auction of oil and gas leases of publicly held land. Having been assigned the title Bitter 70, which is also the title of a documentary about this case, if you're interested, that student, whose real name, whose name is Tim Christopher, entered winning bids for $1.7 million worth of federal land as if he was going to development, develop it, to drill it, and so on. The catch is that he did so, not sincerely, but as an act of civil disobedience. So 
unless your college experience is dra uh, shaping up to be drastically different than mine was, it probably won't come as a surprise that as a college student, Timothy Christopher had neither the intention nor the ability to pay the winning $1.7 million. As a result, several land leases, that areas of land that he placed winning bids on, were canceled, uh, which in turn prevented private companies from um, drilling on public lands. Because his trial concerned a federal agency, Christopher ultimately faced charges in federal court. According to the Climate Defense Project, there have been at least 31 climate disobedient cases in the United States since this time. I obviously won't cover them all here, uh, but it's worth hearing a bit about the details of a few of these cases to get the sense of the humans behind the legal and political risks that they took, they take. So in the spring of 2013, Kim Ward and Jay O'Hara used an 18-foot lobster boat named the Henry David T to block the shipping channel of the Brayton Point coal-fired plant in Somerset, Massachusetts. So they used this little boat down here. In doing so, they blocked 40,000 tons of West Virginia mountaintop coal from being delivered. The Henry David T, again, is this small boat down here at the bottom in front of the much larger Energy Enterprise ship pictured. As you can see and feel from this picture, uh, I think if you imagine, if we imagine ourselves in that small, small boat and imagine the feeling we would have, um, we can get a sense of um, the way that climate disobedience can involve not only sort of legal and um, financial risks, but physical risks as well, right? This could be a dangerous situation. Their case went to trial in the Fall River District Court in Massachusetts. Another high profile case. In October 2016, five activists coordinated with what they called uh, shut it down actions in four states. In these actions, they alerted oil companies that they would be trespassing onto the land and physically shutting off the valves to pipelines. So uh, they're also referred to in media reports sometimes as the valve turners. As a result, the valve turners, or the shut it down activists, stopped 15% of crude oil imports into the US for a day. Uh, um, since then, their trials have taken place in Montana, Washington State, Minnesota, and North Dakota, the four states that they um, took action in. Finally, in 2016, 23 activists were arrested for participating in a, quote, die-in, in which they laid down in a trench um, that was going to be a location for a pipeline. Um, in order to sort of symbolize the harmful effects, the deaths that can be attributed to fossil fuel use, climate change, and so on. This was a protest of the Spectra Energy Pipeline in the Roxbury neighborhood of Boston. Among these 23 arrested was Tim DeChristopher from the first case mentioned above, and none other than Al Gore's own daughter, Karina Gore, pictured here. So even though she was no longer a young person uh, by, the, by this time, Al Gore remarked at the time in an interview that her arrest had made him proud. She was doing what he wanted to see people doing. The trial took place in Boston Municipal Court in Massachusetts in 2018. So I'll come back to all of these cases in a moment. As noted, there are only a few of the 31 cases that the Climate Defense Project is currently tracking, keeping track of, which have occurred steadily from 2008 onward. Other cases, uh, some of which you may have heard of in the news, involve high profile events in New York City called uh, flood Wall Street, protesting Wall Street's continued investment in the fossil fuel industry, protests at the White House um, against both President Obama and then President Trump, protests in front of World Bank buildings, 
uh, actions undertaken in solidarity with Standing Rock water protectors, and so on. The specific laws that such activists break when they commit these acts of civil disobedience are um, wide, are, are broad. So any number of specific laws might be broken, but include things like trespassing, refusal to disperse, breaking and entering, resisting arrest, property damage, and so on. The cases that I just talked about that I'm highlighting today, however, are interesting to me at least insofar are as they each make use of nonviolent civil disobedience, and they each eventually attempt to make use of this emerging legal strategy that I'll talk about in a moment, the necessity defense. They do so with varying degrees of success. So I want to talk a little bit about civil disobedience, and then I'll move on to the necessity defense. So the practice of nonviolent civil disobedience is arguably an ancient one. And it's also arguably a made use of civil disobedience in the interest of left-leaning causes, right-leaning causes, and everything in between. In short, it's the practice of breaking the law in order to do one of two things, or both of them. Some civil disobedience break the law because they feel the need to act in line with their own conscience. Others break the law in order to draw attention to the law and ultimately to get the law itself changed. So one of the earliest examples of civil disobedience that political theorists point to comes from the ancient Greek play Antigone. In that play, the ruler of a city-state, Creon, had forbidden anyone in the city from burying a fallen soldier who had arguably betrayed the city. That soldier's name, who had arguably betrayed the city, was Polynesus, pictured here in the lower right. Polynesus, however, was also Antigone in the center, Antigone's brother. As such, Antigone felt bound by religious duties and her own conscience to bury her brother, to give her brother a proper burial. So she broke Creon's law. She went against the ruler's decree that nobody bury Polynesus and went ahead and buried him. This might seem an odd or trivial case um, in our modern sort of contemporary world, but in the case of the ancient Greeks, um, religious, like really highly important, highly political situations. So here, the reason that Antigone uh, participated in civil disobedience was arguably to, in order to act in line with her own conscience. Right? She wasn't trying to overturn some set of laws about who can bury whom in general. She just felt called or moved to break this particular law in this instance. One of the most famous Americans associated with civil disobedience um, is Henry David Thoreau himself. Eventually, as we just saw, they eventually named a boat about him. Right? Thoreau similarly acted in line with his own conscience by um, participating in civil disobedience by refusing to pay a poll tax that, as a protest against uh, both American slavery and military aggression against Mexico. Here too, he was, um, you know, I think he hoped laws would change, but his primary interest was in acting in line with his own conscience. He felt that he couldn't contribute to an American state that upheld slavery and was aggressive against other countries. Where Antigone and Thoreau seemed highly concerned with expressing their consciences, later waves of civil disobedience were designed explicitly to organize people power in a way that would make actual changes to unjust laws, segregation laws, discrimination laws, and so on in the civil rights era. So the civil disobedience of Martin Luther King Center and the great late John Lewis on the right 
are prime examples of the use of civil disobedience, or good trouble, as Lewis called it, to change unjust laws and practices. As I'll discuss in a moment, uh, the climate disobedience movement, I think, is currently kind of torn between these two broad purposes of civil disobedience, between the need to live in line with our own consciences on the one hand, and the desire to build the political power capable of pressuring governments and corporations and other power holders um, to act, to change laws, to respond to climate change itself. To be sure, um, I think the expression of one's conscience and the attempt to change law can be compatible, right? We can, be, we can aim at doing both of those things simultaneously. But importantly, I also think that um, the pursuit of broader political change can be lost if we get too sucked into the details of that sort of individual conscious expressing mode. More on that in a moment. So whatever the motivation, uh, it's clear that the use of nonviolent civil disobedience in the fight to stop climate change, for climate justice, is gaining steam. It's getting more uh, practitioners, more interest in the media, more legal commentary, and so on. Above and beyond the activists who have risked their liberties, um, other participants include a number of organizations who have recently sprung up to provide research and legal counsel to um, activists, um, environmental groups like 350.org, the Sierra Club, and Extinction Rebellion, have helped organize climate disobedience actions so that they're not just isolated individuals, but they can sort of um, make larger campaigns like we saw in the case of the valve turners. Uh, individual lawyers like Kelsey Skaggs and Lauren Reagan, who represent a lot of climate disobedience, um, have devoted their young careers to this kind of work. Even Christiana Figueres, um, who led the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change as it negotiated the Paris Climate Accords, the most successful international climate agreement to date, has recently called for the increased and immediate use of civil disobedience in order to fight climate change. So even people in charge of the big official institutional responses to climate change have started to make claims about the need for ordinary people to get into good trouble to participate in civil disobedience, given the severity of the climate crisis. So that's uh, just a little bit about the history of civil disobedience. Above, uh, I mentioned the second quality that recent climate disobedience cases shared, which is the necessity defense. Um, as this is likely, I'm guessing, a less familiar idea to you than civil disobedience more broadly, I want to take a few minutes to walk through what the necessity defense is, where it came from, how it works or could work, um, and what climate disobedience hope to use it for. So two, analysis of the necessity defense methods and goals. Necessity defense is a long established part of what is called common law, which means that its use is customary and based on precedent rather than statutory and explicitly codified. That's a lot of jargon. Let me unpack that. In other words, the necessity defense is not always written down somewhere as something specific and explicit that's available to defendants in criminal cases. Um, but rather, it's just a, a method, a tool, a practice, um, a trick that has long been used and is generally seen as acceptable in some, if not all, cases. So as such, the rules and the norms um, governing its use is um, different in different places. So depending on which court you're talking about, which circuit you're talking about, and so on, um, the necessity defense is available or not. Um, we don't need to get into those details. Uh, just know that in what follows, I'm speaking to the kind of broad contours of how this defense works in general. 
Some legal scholars, interestingly, don't exactly agree about the origins of the necessity of defense, but many trace it pretty far back to a 1551 case in England, uh, Renninger versus Vygos. No idea how to pronounce either of those names. If you do, um, let me know in the question and answer. In the case in question, an English, English merchant found himself caught in a deadly storm. So you can imagine um, a ship in 1550 um, being battered by waves and rain and wind and all the rest. In order to save his own life, the shipping vessel itself and the rest of his crew, he, the captain of the ship made the decision to throw his cargo overboard. This kept the ship afloat, kept it from sinking. The problem is that uh, the cargo the captain threw out was not his own, but belonged to somebody else. So while the captain clearly committed this crime of destroying someone else's property, which is a serious crime in England and the United States, we all know, the court ended up acquitting the merchant for dumping cargo, cargo to prevent his ship from capsizing in a storm. He committed this crime and yet he was acquitted. He was found not guilty. In that case, um, the court acquitted this man on the grounds that, quote, a man may break the words of the law and yet not break the law itself in cases in which the words of the law are broken in order to avoid greater inconvenience or through necessity or by compulsion. So in short, the necessity defense holds that an illegal action in question that was necessary in order to avoid a greater evil can be legally justified. So in other words, doing something bad that prevents something worse from happening um, can be permissible sometimes. Something that was illegal, according to this theory, will turn out to have been legal once all the information is known. In other words, necessity defense holds that a lesser evil breaking one law is justified if and when doing so is the only way to avert, avert a greater evil. So in the example above, property destruction can be justified if it's the only way to save human life. In more recent cases, the necessity defense has been used um, to justify things like just, uh, driving with a suspended license. So um, in a case where the illegal driver was the only person available to bring a pregnant woman to a hospital, um, the driver was found not guilty of a crime because they avoided the greater harm of that pregnant person dying or, or you know, whatever medical complications could have ar arisen. It's also been used successfully to um, justify breaking into a property in order to put out a fire that had started uh, in a property that nobody was in. So in each case, a crime is committed, but the would-be criminal is ultimately acquitted, found not guilty, by a judge or jury insofar as they deem the act necessary in order to avoid a worse Faith. Okay, so that said, um, successfully making use of the necessity defense is quite difficult, can be quite difficult. When used in connection with civil disobedience cases, it requires the activist to take significant risk and to be willing to accept the full legal consequences should the defense fail. So Activists have to be willing to be found guilty, to pay fines, to do jail time, and so on. Activists who do choose to nonetheless commit civil disobedience and assert a necessity defense must follow a five-step process. First, they have to get arrested protesting climate change. Second, they have to enter a non-guilty plea. They have to plea not guilty. Even though they admit they did the act in question, they maintain their innocence. Third, they have to, um, in a pretrial setting, offer the necessity defense to the judge, 
who can either allow it or disallow it. Um, as what is called an affirmative defense, the necess necessity defense requires the defendant to actually convince the jury that they are not guilty. So a normal criminal trial, we all know, presumes innocence until proven guilty. But to successfully argue a necessity to case, uh, defense, the defendant must affirm or prove that they are actually innocent because they, in some sense, had to do what they did. Fourth, they have to um, present the defense to the jury and, you know, um, as I just said, prove it to the jury or convince the jury of it. And then fifth, they await the decision, in which case they might be acquitted if things go well or convicted if they don't. So again, there are a lot of hurdles here. The trickiest hurdle happens at step three um, in recent cases, in trying to convince the judge to allow the defense. Um, it's difficult to convince a judge to allow the necessity defense in cases of civil disobedience, but it has been done successfully multiple times in cases of anti-war and anti-nuclear protests, and judges have allowed it a handful of times in climate cases as well. Likewise, in order to convince um, a judge to allow the necessity defense, so to clear step three, hurdle three, a defendant has to convince the judge of four things. And then later they have to convince the jury of these things if they want to be acquitted. First, the defendant has to convince the judge and jury they faced a clear and imminent danger, not a um, danger that is distant or far off or speculative. So, um, the danger has to be very close. Second, they have to convince the judge that the defendant had a reasonable expectation that the action they did could stop the danger in step one. Third, the defendant has to convince the judge there's no legal activity uh, alternative, no other thing they could have done that wasn't illegal to stop the danger, um, or no reason to believe that legal alternatives would work. And then fourth, they have to show that there's no policy on the books that um, is sort of prohibits the use of the necessity defense in this specific case, this courtroom, and so on. So um, in the case of climate change, a defendant has to convince a judge and then a jury that climate change itself is a clear and imminent danger, here and now, something that will um, something that is occurring now, not something that just will occur in the future or a faraway place. They must also offer evidence that their action, something like blocking an oil train, shutting off a valve to a pipeline, and so on, will have a direct impact on climate change. They must show also that there's no legal alternative action that they could have done, like lobbying Congress, writing letters to representatives, or voting, um, they, obviously, those things are usually available. So defendants have to show, convince a judge that those things haven't worked, right, or we shouldn't expect them to work. And then finally, they have to make uh, a convincing case that the defense is allowed. So again, one more time, um, convincing a judge, let alone a full jury, that climate disobedience action was necessary is difficult to put it lightly. As one commentator puts it, due to the court's hesitation, it is appropriate to define success in climate change necessity defense cases, not by whether the jury actually acquits, so not whether you're found not guilty or guilty or what have you, but to define the case um, when the jury heard the necessity defense and decided on its merits. So this uh, legal commentator is saying that the use of the necessity defense is so difficult that even just getting a jury to hear it should be considered a success. Given that all the juries in the world could, hypothetically, as climate change could remain intact, I'm not convinced that this is the best definition of success here. 
Uh, but because the meaning of success isn't clear, we don't know what, how we should think about a successful necessity defense, uh, it's worth it discussing the various levels of success at play and the different goals that different climate disobedience might have in mind when they attempt such a strategy, right? So obviously at some level, their goal is, their shared goal is to stop climate change. But um, in different cases, they might have different sort of more modest goals. So when one reads through the websites uh, of climate disobedience organizations, when one reads legal analyses, essays written by those who have been arrested, and so on, we get a number of different understandings of success. Paraphrasing, we might define a successful necessity defense in the following ways. Getting a prosecutor not to pursue a case um, in order to avoid establishing the necessity defense. So getting a prosecutor to drop the case. Or success might mean getting a judge to acquit to find you not guilty in a bench trial, a trial that doesn't have a jury. Or uh, success might be defined, as we just heard, by getting to present the necessity defense to a jury. More difficultly, it might be convinced of, be, uh, uh, might be defined as being found not guilty by reason of necessity. So your case was actually convincing to a jury. More broadly, um, success might be seen as establishing the necessity defense as broadly valid so that other people can use it. Um, six, success might mean after establishing the defense is valid, actually seeing more and more people participate in climate disobedience. And then of course, ultimately success comes in the form of stopping carbon dioxide emissions, attaining climate justice, what have you. So as you can see, uh, number one, success people on trial, or it can be quite um, transformative and collective about the common well-being of the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, okay, so as such, it's worth also noting that specific defendants have different goals when they attempt to use this necessity defense. These different goals loosely map on to the different measures of success. So this is getting a bit complicated, but um, I think it'll become clearer eventually. I uh, do want a quick warning that the next slide is going to have a lot of text in a table. Uh, I don't want you to read through it right away because I will talk through it. Okay, so if activists define success as a prosecutor not pursuing the case or a judge finding them not guilty, modest, goal, uh, modest measures, then their goal can be seen as the following. Their goal might be to temporarily stop the infrastructures that enable climate change. So stopping a coal shipment for 15 minutes. That kind of goal is common to all of these measures. Or their goal might be to simply personally avoid penalty that is associated with disobedience um, to enact their own individual conscience without facing super harsh consequences. If the uh, measure of success is number three from the previous slide, to get the judge to accept the defense and, pre uh, and presenting the defense to a jury, they might have some further goals, like getting as experts to testify in court about the dangers of climate change, about how legal routes haven't been efficient at change. Uh, fighting climate change, about the extent to, um, to testify about the ways that governments have failed to act, and so on. So uh, if the measure of success is presenting uh, the defense to a jury, the goal might also be broader, sort of educating publics and juries themselves about climate change. And often in these cases, um, jurors have approached defendants after the case and thanked them for educating the jury on climate change. If the measure of getting the jury to find the defendant not guilty, 
The goal might be all of the above, plus establishing precedent so that future activists can use the defense. And then finally, if we only measure success of the necessity defense, if and when it actually um, invites for future waves of civil disobedience, then we're going to say that the goal of the use of it is all of the above, plus the broad goal of slowing, stopping, eventually repairing the damage done by climate change. OK, so that's how these folks seek to use the necessity defense and what they hope to accomplish. Uh, let's look quickly back to the cases I mentioned earlier in order to see how far they've come and see what roadblocks have gotten in the way. In the case of the United States versus De Christopher, so the case in which De Christopher bid on land that he didn't pay for, the government blocked the use of the necessity defense. So it was a failure. De Christopher was convicted by a jury and sentenced to 24 months in prison. He served 21 of those months and was released. Uh, in the case of Massachusetts v. O'Hara, um, the case of the Henry David T, the necessity defense was allowed. Fearing that the defense would be successful, the prosecutor dropped the case. This was welcome news to the defendants, um, though they were also disappointed that their expert witnesses couldn't testify. After dropping the case, the prosecutor gave a speech outside the courtroom where he endorsed the supporters of climate disobedience and supported increased action on climate change. So that is a rare outcome to say the least. But the person who is supposed to be, uh, we need to see more of that. Uh, the shut it down or valve turners cases were a mixed bunch. There were a number of cases. So judges in Montana and North Dakota wouldn't allow the defense. On appeal, a judge in Washington state allowed Ken Ward to use the defense which established its validity in Washington. So now other climate activists will be able to use it. Um, that trial itself is pending, so I'll be keeping a close eye on it to see whether the jury finds um, Ken Ward's defense convincing. In Minnesota, also on appeal, the necessity defense was allowed by a judge, but the defendants were acquitted by the judge before they could argue their case before a full jury. So again, this was a kind of partial success. Finally, in the Massachusetts v. Gore case, um, the necessity defense was allowed, but again, fearing its success, prosecutors dropped the charges um, to civil infractions, so made them less significant and the defendants were acquitted or found not guilty. So Al Gore didn't have to see his daughter go to prison, Tim to Christopher didn't have to go to prison for a second time, but nor was the case permitted to go before a jury and be successful in that sense. So on the whole, then, the use of the defense in climate disobedience cases remains in an early stage. Right? It's done these first three um, measures of success, it hasn't completed the last four. Um, it has not yet earned an acquittal before a jury. The first test in those terms is taking place in this Washington State case. Uh, but it has seen some success as seen in the green numbers here. Right? So activists hope to achieve the other successes soon. Right? So, you know, we're in some ways I'm I'm thinking through this as it's ongoing, and we're right in the thick of sort of collectively seeing whether this ends up being a useful strategy. Okay, um, so what can we make of all of this? It would be an easy point to say, uh, to point to the fact that climate change still exists and say that these activists have not yet stopped it, and to conclude that the necessity defense is therefore a failure. Um, too easy to do that, in my opinion. My critique is different. It's not to say that these folks have failed. It's that there's a great risk here, um, that the political energy that goes into climate disobedience might get diluted um, if and when the more modest versions of success and more individualizing goals discussed above are pursued. So in other words, the pursuit of a successful necessity defense in and of itself 
risks is, uh, eclipsing the broader pursuit of a stable climate. So the point of all of this, it seems to me, of what these activists are doing, is to make use of a surprising tool in the fight against climate change. The necessity defense should be used in a way that keeps that ultimate goal in mind, even if smaller measures of success and more modest goals are necessary steps in the right direction. As I alluded to earlier, I think this tension is in civil disobedience itself. Right? There's two forms of justice in civil disobedience. In one, civil refers to a calm, dispassionate expression of one's own conscience, independent of the results. In the second, civil refers to improvement of public things, and common well-being. So if, if the former, if we take the former sense of civil disobedience, then the necessity defense might already be successful. Its success might be independent of the warming world we all live in. Climate justice might simply consist in expressing one's disagreement with climate change by acting out. But few of the activists discussed above would content themselves with such a goal. They will all want something more than that. And the broader goal of stopping climate change and producing a more stable world shows up in their defenses, their rhetoric, their public writings. My modest contribution here is to suggest that such activists and the organizations and lawyers um, through which they organize, they want to focus attention on the broader political goals of the movement, using the necessity defense as a tactic, and resist the temptation to define success in terms of simply presenting a defense in front of a jury or using establishing a defense in and of itself. If climate disobedience can actually be a useful tool in the fight for climate justice, climate justice might just depend on their ability to focus on political, not simply individual forms of justice. So that's it. Uh, thanks for listening. And I've managed to leave some time, I think, for questions, if there are any. Great, thank you so much. Uh, so yes, you can use, again, that Q&A to submit questions. Um, and while we're getting those to start um, flowing in, I do have a question for you, not so much specific to this particular topic, but more generally. Um, could you talk a little bit about what research looks like in a department like political science? Because so often, you know, we hear the word research and automatically everyone thinks science, you know, test tubes, lab coats. And so I think sometimes it's hard to conceptualize how that looks in a non-science field. So could you talk a bit more about that? Absolutely, um, great question. Um, the answer is it's very complicated and that there are two big camps, two big kind of forms of political science that don't always talk to one another, unfortunately. So um, for some, political science research is uh, largely based on kind of measuring empirically, sometimes predicting things like public opinion, um, things like voting um, records in Congress, or congressional behavior, things of political institutions, right? So those kind, that kind of political research, um, which I don't do, so I'm speaking about it very broadly and vaguely, um, is somewhat more similar to the kinds of science that we're all familiar with, right? To kind of coming up with a hypothesis, um, using um, statistical and other methods to test one's hypothesis, and then putting it forward as a thesis or as a general rule of politics, right? Um, I would say that's the bulk of political science. Uh, I work, as I said at the beginning, in political theory, which is um, also part of political science, but rooted in and sort of works similar to longer sort of philosophical traditions, right? So, Political theorists are less, when we do research, we're less concerned to kind of empirically measure patterns out there in the political world. And we try instead to um, kind of interpret old political texts. That's one of the big ones. You make arguments about what past philosophers have thought um, or to um, think about normative uh, 
uh, implications of political practices. That's kind of, well, there's this set of practices that people are participating in, uh, and I want to analyze whether these are desirable practices, useful, whether they have drawbacks, whether they could be um, better enacted, and so on and so forth, right? So again, two big camps, one more scientific in the standard sense, one more philosophical, right? And the very best um, political scientists who have more than 24 hours in the day, I think, kind of can do both and make them speak to each other. But most of us stick to one or the other of those camps. Yes. Thanks so much. Uh, now, on that same note, do you think that the department at UCSB fits into either of those camps predominantly, or does there tend to be um, a pretty even split among faculty? Mm -hmm. um, at this department, um, there, you know, at this department and most departments, I think uh, the emphasis is on the political science aspect, on the kind of um, methods-based um, empirical observation, but it has a fairly sizable uh, political theory component as well. And um, we tend to get along, I think. Um, some departments, the, there's a little bit of antagonism between the two. Uh, so I think both can be found here. And um, even as there's you know, a little bit more people working in the, again, the sort of political science side of things. Thanks so much. Um, OK, so we've got a question saying, I, want, uh, I was wondering if civil disobedience appears to you like it is challenging the court systems rather than the capitalist financial systems, and if this concentration on court systems dilutes the message. Uh, that's a really great question, and um, actually does, I think, dovetail with where I was going at the end. Um, I do think that you know, if these activists remain hyper-focused on sort of uh, establishing this as a legal tool, uh, they might miss the broader picture, right? Um, we get a lot of arguments. We've heard a lot of arguments in recent years from Naomi Klein and others um, that it's actually that climate change is a capitalism problem, right? That we wouldn't have climate change to the degree we do if we had an alternate economic system, right? Um, I suppose if you were really critical of these activists, you could say that they are, exactly as the question asked, focusing attention on the legal system rather than the economic system, right? Um, but I think, I think what, well, I don't wanna put words in their mouth, but what I conclude by reading and thinking alongside these activists um, is that they wouldn't, they, they wouldn't really separate these out, right? That law is actually needed um, to, enforce and uh, facilitate um, capitalism or economics. And so that if there is an economic cause to climate change, one can kind of address it through law um, as well, right? Um, I tend to fall into that, that way of thinking, but you know, um, we look for political agency where we can find it. And I think this is one place where people could focus attention if they want. Um, I think, you know, Maybe, maybe people more radical would find this to be uh, too slow, right? Something that isn't actually going to make widespread change in a quick enough time frame. So uh, the short answer to the question is yes, I think this could be something of a distraction. And yet I think there's also something worthwhile here given how difficult the question of political agency in climate change is in general. Thank you. Now we're getting a couple questions from um, folks who are interested in, in ways to get involved. And mm -hmm. this ranges a bit, so I'm, I'm kind of combining a bunch of questions here, but do you have any resources where folks can look maybe more so just to learn about um, the legal side of the fight for climate justice, what's been done, and then also like how can people get involved maybe at varying levels? Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, so in terms of resources, um, there are a couple documentaries that, you know, that's always the easiest way in, I think, at least for me. Um, I don't remember the names. One is just called Bitter 70, and one is called um, something else. It's about Ken Ward. So if you search sort of Ken Ward, W-A-R-D, climate change documentary, it'll come up. Um, and uh, both of those chronicle these folks um, 
as they participated in these acts of civil disobedience, as they make their way through the legal system, and so on. Right? So um, that isn't sort of directly going to give you ways to get involved, but um, it will um, show you more about who the players are, what kind of organizations are out there, what they're doing, and so on. Uh, um, likewise, the I mentioned it somewhere um, is, and, and there are a few others, um, are available on the web. So if you just search climate disobedience um, organization, you'll find some groups that have resources for people who want to be involved in one way or another. Um, you know, I think uh, I don't actually know too much about what's around campus. I know there uh, is a branch of CalPERG that works uh, on environmental issues, works specifically on environmental justice issues uh, in Santa Barbara and beyond. Um, I might be a little bit of uh, a partisan for CalPERG because I interned for the UC Santa Cruz branch when I was a student there, um, but that would be the first thing around campus that I would uh, recommend. Um, and again, also there's local chapters of things like 350 um, and others that um, you, can, you can find in the area. And if anybody wants to know more about some of those or has trouble finding some of those groups, um, feel free to send me an email. You can find my info on the political science uh, faculty page uh, and I'm, I'll, I'd be happy to do some digging for you. Thanks so much. And I did a quick Google search while you were talking and I think the documentary you referred to is The Reluctant Radical. So I, uh, I posted a link to that in the chat for all of exactly. you. Exactly. Thank interested. you. Of course. So we're getting close to the end. So I have, I have one last question for you, and it's kind of along the lines of getting involved at UCSB, but could you talk about how you or your colleagues uh, utilize undergraduate students in your research? Yeah, um, good question. So I uh, am actually fairly new here, and I haven't been able to do that very much yet. Uh, I would like to at some point. Um, I probably will have at some point research uh, trajectories or research tasks that have actually to do with this kind of stuff. Um, in which case, I would ask undergraduates to um, do the kind of boring but important work of you know reading through case documents, court documents, um, and so on, so that we could sort of figure out what's going on in these cases in greater and greater degree, right? Um, I know that on the environmental front, uh, Leah Stokes, another professor in the department, um, who is a well-known name in environmental politics, um, has been working with some undergrad students uh, in, in, in some sort of more applied lab work. So if you find yourself uh, on campus, actually, or digitally, and want to check out what she's, Leah Stokes is doing, Professor Stokes, um, I think that would be a good place uh, to start in the department as well. Great. Thank you so much. So we are at the hour and I want to be respectful of everyone's time this evening. So first, I want to thank you for taking some time and, and really sharing with us. I had never heard of this defense before, so this was all new to me. Um, thank you to all of our attendees and thank you for your questions. I know we didn't have a chance to get to all of them, but conversation doesn't have to end. You're always welcome to reach out. We're happy to help connect you as needed. Um, but with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and end the meeting. So thanks again, everyone, and have a great rest of your night. Thank you.